Coming up next on Living on the Edge with We think just like this. And you read a book and you find out what happened in China. And you read a book and you find out what happened years ago. Welcome to Living on the Edge. My name is Chip Ingram. This is called Good to Great in God's Eyes. And if that rings a bell, like I think I've heard of a business book that uh, it's by design. Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, that was written for business people, had a big impact on my life. And the real key to that book was the paradigm. And that paradigm was what are the practices that great companies have in common? And what I wanted to talk and think and pray and a teaching on is what are the practices that great Christians have in common. If you've just joined us, uh, we just started the series the last couple weeks. About one of the practices, great Christians think great thoughts. They are very careful about what goes into their mind, what they think on, because you are a product of your thought life. Now, what we're going to talk about in this session is that they read great books. And, and I mean way, way back, all the way back to St. Augustine. Uh, he read great books. He was a scholar. In the early days, from early Christianity all the way through today, when you meet people that are great in God's eyes, that are highly esteemed, that he greatly uses, there is this correlation about they are readers. Now, I hear this. What I know is we are in a video age. I meet people who, honestly, I did some uh, The average American adult, after they graduate from high school, something like 60% since high school. Of college graduates, it's only about 40%. So we're not in an age of readers. But I have to tell you, we're going to talk about the power of a book. Turning off, of turning off that TV and, you know, opening a book, beginning to let God speak to you and encourage you. We're going to talk about books that will do things for your mind, books that do things for your heart. In fact, as we open this up, I'm going to book other than the Bible that radically changed my life. I was a young man. I was playing basketball on a team with an Australian. Mary handed me a little paperback book and I don't want to spoil it. I want to tell you the story but that little thin book has been in my briefcase for over 30 years. A month has not been by in 30 years that I haven't read at least a chapter of that book. It's a think, how I pray, how I treat people, because book is about what God is really like. Can't wait. To you know, I pray that when we get done, say to yourself, you know something? I think I'm really love the power books can have in my life. Great Christians think great thoughts, and great Christians read great books. Let's dig in together. Here is not. I'm a young guy who has uh, ended up on an Australian basketball team. I'm in graduate school, winter break, about a three-week stint where I was going to join an Australian team, go throughout the Orient, play basketball, and share Christ. I found myself about 22 floors up or so in a uh, missionary's room. And in this room, he has a small library, but they're all paperback books. And I'd ask a few questions when we came and shared some time. It happened in 1978. He put something... Something that he put in my hand, God... He put in my hand, and God put in my hand. I put in my briefcase for about 30 years. What that is was a book. One very expensive little book by a man who's been dead for a while. The knowledge of the Holy. This is my updated copy, and I can say this because it's with warm affection. My wife gave me the updated copy. The original copy I Hong Kong was 
the peel apart and the pages were falling apart. And uh, uh, gave me one a couple years ago. A.W. Tozer's Knowledge of the Holy is about God himself. It's a book on the attributes of God. In the beginning, what comes into our minds when we think God is the most important thing. The history of mankind will probably show that has ever risen above its religion and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion is ever greater than its idea of God to his application. For this reason, the gravest, the most question before the church is always and the most portentous fact is not what he is at a given time or what he may say or do, but what in his heart, in the depth of his heart, he conceives God to be like. For there is a secret law of the soul toward our mental image of God. Christian. And what I had in my mind, all of you have in your mind. You have this jigsaw puzzle of what you've, what you've seen, a snippet at church. Maybe you read a little of the Bible. I didn't read the Bible growing up. All these different pieces that have built a collage in your mind. And when you bow your head or get on your knees, you have a picture or a mental concept of who he is it is right and if it is accurate dynamic things will happen in your life and if it is wrong it will impact and influence every religion, every your identity and your life will be determined by how clear you are and you say a little overstatement that this is the, no you know why this is this book book in the last 30 years as I've gotten up every morning and said Lord you know what I'm just a regular guy and you know there's a big world you created and I believe that you love me but um, I've got lots of images about what I thought you were like that are pretty erroneous and so what I'd like to do is I know it's going to be but I want to let you know that every day I'm going to chip away and I'm asking you will you create will you help me me as I take what you've shown of God, what you're really like, in my mind, in my heart, so that I really pray to who you really are. So that when I read a promise, I believe this is the God who gave the promise. So that when you give me a challenge and you say, do this, and everything in my flesh says, I don't want to do that, that I could remember that you are a good God, that you wouldn't withhold any good or perfect gift. Could I remember that you've died for me, that you love me, that I'm the object of your faith? help me a right view of you it would lead to a right view of me a life that little by little by little by little Paul Christ but significantly different transformed changed light in the world as salt that's my prayer and what I want you to know is that um, when we think about going from good to great, I think there is a practice. Something very tangible you can do. Every great Christian that I have ever met, every great Christian that I have ever read about, are people who read great books. That's practice number one. If you want to be a great Christian and you say, well, is this pie in the sky? No. If you want to be a great Christian in God's eyes, practice number one is read Great books. The scripture, Romans, one key text for every one of these. Two. Be conformed. Literally, stop being conformed. The great in such a way that the Roman church was being conformed by this world. It was being molded. Even though they knew Christ, even though they had a new life, their thinking, their speech, their lifestyle, what they did with their money, their marriages, it was being corroded and formed and molded by the world system that they lived in. And so the Apostle Paul, after verse 1, saying, is offer your body as a living sacrifice, then he would say, now, stop being formed to this world, but be literally metamorphosized, meta change, morphosized, with change. 
Let your mind be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind with what result? That your life, literally your lifestyle could prove or demonstrate what the will of God is. That which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That word approved or test was used for, uh, they would put acid on a metal and find out, you know, the quality of the metal. It's the idea of living the kind of life so that as people would, you know, scratch beneath the surface of singing the song or reading the Bible or going to church that your life would prove, it would test out that God's will is good, it's acceptable, it's well-pleasing. And how do you get there? you got to renew your mind, and I believe the number one way to renew our mind is to read great books. And so if you'll open your notes, what I want to do in our time together is I want to give you maybe a few categories and a few suggestions. I'll share some great books that have changed my life. And now, these, they, these were ones that were great for me. I think these are great books, but other books in these categories will be just as helpful or more helpful for you. But uh, first, I'd like to suggest you need to read great books and broaden your world. Right in the world. You, you need, see, your world and my world, we, we think just like this. And you find out what happened in China. What happened 3,000 years ago. Great books broaden your world. And as a believer, I think biographies. I, I not only did not open the Bible growing up, but I mean, I didn't have any Christian books. And early in my Christian life, within probably five years, three books came across. Dawes. He was the founder of the Navigators. And it's a great book. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's great literature. I read that book because what I realized was, wow, this guy's a popular guy. Dawes was a guy that went to, went to college. Dawes was a guy that was an... You know, I could identify a cute little girl and he was... Went to the old youth group and they challenged the youth group. I'm word perfect next week. Here's the prize. He's sort of the competitive ego guy and he's going to show this girl how smart he is. So he memorizes all 10 verses. And he goes back to the little youth group and, like many youth groups, here he is the one who did it. This is where in his mind. And whoever was the head of Romans 3.23 is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that, in, that we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And then call upon the Lord. Those who call upon the Lord will be saved. And then Ephesians 9. Ten basic verses on the gospel. And Dawes tells a story of just going through life and sort of a little bit of a rebel motorcycle, black leather jacket, and, you know, sort of a, had a little rebellious streak in him. He was walking by a hardware store, and these verses were popping into his mind. It wasn't about, it wasn't about activities. It wasn't about going to church. When you understand Christ died for you personally and that you need to personally turn away and repent of your sin and that the Spirit of God would come into your life and you could be a new creature and have a brand new life and all your sin can be forgiven forever and ever and ever and the Spirit of God would take up residence and the God of the universe would be your friend. And guide you and he would... And because he didn't have a lot of religious upbringing, he didn't... grow very rapidly, and as I read through the book, you know, I'm a new Christian, maybe a year or two by this time, and, and you know, I'm just, I've never read it, I'm at first year, I read through the New Testament, and then read through it again, and read through it again, and I understand a lot of it, but the, the thirst and the change, and, and from that book I thought, well, I'm like real ordinary, I've never been to Bible school, I didn't grow up as a Christian, I've only been through the New Testament a couple times, but it kind of seems like dog other believers here, you know, and it seems like God just loves other people. And then someone put uh, Uncle Cam. It's the story of the founder of Wycliffe. Uh, 
guy that, you know, you read, and they're pretty honest in the biography. He's, he doesn't bring by outward standards to the table. He's not necessarily an overly attractive person physically. He's not necessarily someone with a lot of great social skills. And he ends up in a missionary. And as you open the book, you find he's on a street corner in Mexico. And he says to this guy trying to share his faith, Do you know Jesus? And the guy says, Jesus, see. He lives down here, take two blocks, lives over there. <laughs> and, and Cameron realized, oh, man, no, no, no. Jesus, Jesus Cristo. Je and, and the guy just looked at him like, buddy, I, I know what you're talking about. I don't have a clue. One man. One man. And it's the story of a man who had a lot of adversity. It's the story of a man that um, didn't have a lot of the outward. man who had a dream and a focus to translate the Bible in every single language people group in the world and the SIL Institute now Christian or non-Christian is, is probably the best linguistics in the world and it's been translated in ten thousands of languages because of another ordinary guy why read great books it broadens your world I got one message in those first three to five years as an early Christian. Here's the message I got. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You know how you get that? By reading great books. These aren't made up stories. These aren't fairy tales. And, you know, ask yourself how much of the media is going into your heart and into your mind over and over and over, whether it's or talk radio or whether it's this program or that program or the DVDs or the rented movies and all the junk that's constantly bombarding you, and you're trying to be a, a spiritual fish swimming upstream to be godly, ask yourself how much of great books are going into your mind. Read great books. First, books that broaden, that broaden your world. Second, read great books that sharpen your mind. There's another book on the attributes of God that became uh, of the holy, and then I went to J.I. Packer. It's a classic book, Knowing God. Th those two books just shaped my view of who God was. And then I met, I was on another basketball team. You can tell I kind of like basketball. If you like basketball stories, it's going to be a great morning. <laughs> if you don't, I have other stories for later. But I was on a basketball team with a pre-med student from Minnesota, and we were traveling throughout South America. And, and uh, I, I came to Christ, but I didn't have any background. And so uh, I was going into grad school, and uh, grad school at a secular place is not like a, uh, a warm, loving, non-hostile environment for believers. And as people were challenging my thinking, I, I knew what God had done in me, but I did not have good intellectual answers for the very strong intellectual questions. And so uh, I'll never forget this pre-med student. He introduced me to Francis Schaeffer. Any, anybody here familiar with Francis Schaeffer and his work? Yeah. And uh, so he said, read his trilogy first. His work, he has uh, three books. I put them there. You know, you have the, um, he is there and he's not silent, escape from reason and the God who was there. And they are fairly philosophical and he has his own kind of lingo and he makes up a few words. And the very first book I read, he is there and he's not silent, you know, and I hated myself. And what I found out, there was a very smart, logical, intellectual thinker that had dealt with the basic is issues of reality and the issues of why am I here? And is there a God? And what's the intellectual basis for our reasoning and our thinking? And I took those three books and I made that the foundation for writing my thesis at West Virginia University when I did grad work there. And I found a Christian professor that let me take that and some empirical research in sociology and psychology and smash those things together and get myself in a situation where I had to defend my thesis with four doctors and I sitting at this table with this little glass of water and basically my thesis was on is truth relative or absolute? And if it's absolute, is it intellectually feasible that the absolute truth could be Jesus Christ and what the Bible has to say? One Christian guy who let me write it because I had to get permission, and three people who thought I was an absolute idiot. And for three hours, we had fun. I, I just, you know, everyone has a different personality. I love that time. I mean, it was so fun going back and forth with them. And I remember uh, one doctor was a guy that, you know, uh, was really pushing me hard. And uh, what Schaefer would teach you is you bring people back to their presuppositions. And so he would make comments about there's not relative truth, and I would just keep pushing him back to what he said versus how he lived. 
lived, what he said versus how he lived. And we got to the end, and I remember the other female turned to him. Would you be quiet? You're digging a bigger and bigger and bigger hole. Let's just give it up. We not, may not believe in his God, but there's got to be absolute truth. <laughs> and I got an A. We read books first that broaden our mind, second to sharpen our mind, and third, read great books that inflame your heart, that inflame your heart. I remember the first book ever that inflamed my heart was E.M. Bounds. It's called The Power of Prayer. And, I, and don't read that one unless like you're, it's psychologically in sort of, you know, a good state of mind. In, in the early part of his book, I mean, this guy has written a zillion books on prayer, and all of them, when you get done, you just want to wilt and say, I am so guilty, I am so lacking, I am such a spiritual worm, but it's kind of good for you. You know, just not too much. But he says in that book, what the world needs is not more men, not more money, not more machinery, not even people who think about prayer, not people who talk about prayer, not people who explain prayer. What God is looking for is men and women who pray, who really pray, who believe that God is real and bring the needs before him and believe that he will answer. That is what God's looking for. It is the hardest discipline in the world because I believe prayer is the barometer of genuine humility. And my self-sufficiency, my honest evaluation of how much I need God or don't need God can be measured by the quantity of my prayer life. I mean, I mean let's do the math. There's an all-knowing being. He knows what's going to happen at the end of the day, the end of history. He has unlimited power. He calls you his child. He has saved you. He's redeemed you, made you a part of his family told you he wants to guide you he wants to bless you he's a good god he has a great plan for your life he wants to for you he wants to use you he has a plan for your life he supernaturally gets he put his spirit in you and he wants to do all these things in your life and we get up in the morning and say, I don't really have time to talk to you because i basically know what to do with my life and how to do it i didn't have time what what what, what, what? And so we think that, you know, riding in the car now, and the, Lord, thanks. You know, we do the little quickie prayers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, you know what? I want to practice the presence of God. I want to have quickie prayers. I want to pray in the car. I want to pray as I walk. But you have the discipline of times that are blocked off. Meet with God, and you open your heart, and you get up, and you get real. If you just tuned in or maybe caught the broadcast in the middle, my name is Chip Ingram. You're watching Living on the Edge, and we're in a series called Good to Great in God's Eyes. And we're looking and, and studying those things that great Christians have in common. Our first podcast, we talk about thoughts. And in this, we begin to talk about how great Christians read great books. You know, as you picked up the broadcast today, we learned that reading books that broaden your world are critical. And then we talked about books that sharpen your mind. I hope you didn't miss the point. The books that broaden your world. I was a new Christian. I had not read, honestly, uh, unless I had to read a book in class, I didn't read I played basketball, baseball, you know, goofed off with my friends. But as I began to open this book, and as I began to read the Bible, and Years, people like this. He's been teaching people that have walked with him. I wanted to learn from them. Early biographies of Dawson Trotman, who started the Navigators, or uh, Cameron Townsend, who started Wycliffe Bible, or I remember reading Billy Graham's biography, and it was a big, thick one. And yes, I had it on my nightstand. I just read 10 pages every night, and it took me about six months. But as I began to watch the patterns, you know something I learned? They're ordinary people. You're an ordinary person. I'm an ordinary person. Begin to read. When you watch something on video, it's sort of surreal. It's another world. It happens very fast. And you're passive. When I'm watching TV, I'm back here, and it's happening out there. When you begin to read a book, it's a different kind of medium. As you read it, your imagination clicks in. And you picture what's happening there. And different things happen in your mind and in your heart. And I believe that there's a reason why great Christians read great books. And so let me ask you, without feeling guilty, 
What's the last book you read that had some real spiritual content that did something for you? And if it's been a long, long time, rather than ability, what if you pick one out? And could I suggest maybe start with the Bible? Start with Taylor or Dawson Trotman. Someone that has really impacted the world. Struggles, ups and downs. You're going to hear about the Charles Haddon Spurgeons, the greatest preacher probably of the 19th century. Huge bouts with depression. You'll learn about marriage problems. You'll learn about challenges. And what you'll realize is all these people that they're just like you. They're just like me. But there's something. The other issue we talked about broaden your world, but books that sharpen your mind. Uh, you know, there is no substitute. Often I'll have someone come to me and say, you know, I heard you talking to that person in a cult, or I heard you in a question and answer, and boy, they were asking all those questions. Where did you learn all that? I've got news for you. It wasn't in seminary. It wasn't in formal classes. Those things were very helpful. But you know how you really learn? People ask you very questions. And I don't know about you, but usually I don't know the answer. But guess where they are? You know, Josh McDowell in Evidence That Demands a Verdict, or Francis Schaeffer in his work, or people who've done great work that help us understand things that we're not with. But when you dig in yourself and you get a pen out and a piece of paper and you take some notes, that's when ideas and concepts go from your mind to your heart to convictions. So when you can begin to answer questions, the person who learns the most is you. Can I challenge you? Guilt trip, no oughts, no shoulds. But what if just one night a week, you just turned off that television about 45 minutes before you went to bed, went this week and said, what's one book? You know, I've really wanted to put it next to your nightstand, turn on that light, and just for 20 minutes, I mean, just 20 minutes, read a little before you go to bed. You know, a world will open up. Your imagination is going to just, I mean, begin to explode. You're going to see something begin to occur in you and then through you that maybe hasn't happened in a long time.